that you learn by making mistakes, both as an athlete and as a coach. And we made loads, but it was no disaster. We learned from them. We went back and changed them. And, and I say this to everybody in my squad. You don't learn by winning anything. You learn from your mistakes. Welcome to the Upside Strength Podcast, your number one resource for all things fitness and performance in Switzerland. Today, I'm happy to welcome former international sprinter and sprint coach, Margo Wells. Hey, Margo, thanks for coming on the show today. Good morning. Pleasure to see you. Um, for the audience, for people who may, might not know who you are and what you do, can you talk a little bit about yourself? Oh, over the years, I've done a lot of things. I started as a sprinter. Then I coached my husband, who won Olympic 100 meter gold and 200 meter silver. Mm -hmm. um, and that was very stressful. <laughs> and I did that for, I'm not recommending it to anybody really. Um, and that really was, took up about 12 years of my life. I was also a teacher, I was a physical education teacher at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, then we had two beautiful young children. And then a rugby club invited my husband to do the job. And he was too busy to do the job, so I did it. Um, and that kind of started me on a path that I never really anticipated going on. Mm -hmm. um, I had a lot of success with just making people faster and run faster for longer. Mm -hmm. um, I found it an interesting journey in, because in athletics, I had a huge amount of respect for what I'd achieved. And I found rugby very, um, not so welcoming, shall we say. Um, really, all I ever wanted to do was to teach people how to run fast. Mm -hmm. Because it's the most amazing thing in the world. I, I mean, it's indefensible for a start there's nothing you can do if somebody runs faster whether it's in 100 meter sprint or on a field or mm -hmm. on a pitch or whatever it is what everybody craves and everybody thinks is unattainable when you know it is an, it, okay you might not win the olympics but you can certainly run faster than you've ever run before yeah where, where do you then think start, sorry, sorry, go on. sorry to cut you off where do you think that preconceived notion of Oh, once you're past, I don't know, some people say 12, some people say 15. Once you're past a certain age, there's no way to improve your speed anymore. Speed is built at a young age and then nothing can be done later on. I mean, we, we both know that this is, this is not true, not in the least. You can make many people faster regardless of their age. Where do you think that idea comes from to begin with? Why do people it, think it, that you can't get faster? It comes from people who can't do it. Hmm. So a child will say, make me faster. Oh, no, no, you're slow, you're slow. There's nothing you can do about it. And I hear that so many times. And children are so influential. And if you tell a child that, they will believe it. And I have the devil's own job sometimes. I mean, I can change speed immediately. And they look at me like I'm a witch. Or I've got a magic potion in my pocket that I've sprinkled over their head. It is just the worst thing to tell anybody. Mm -hmm. And so, sorry, keep on going. You were, you were telling the story of, of your, your journey into rugby and, and, and how you kind of came into that world that, in an unexpected way. Well, I'm very old, so I've got quite a lot. Of, <laughs> I've got quite a long journey. Um, I then branched into hockey. Mm -hmm. Then the big change for me was the, um, developing functionality. So certain people in a lot of sports are very successful because their body moves in a functional way. Mm -hmm. So think Roger Federer, think Messi, think Danny Cipriani, think all these people who move effortlessly, athletes who win things. Well, I thought it was a bit unfair really. So I can now create that functionality and the difference that has made to a my job, people I coach, people um, who have one-to-ones with me just to be able to change how they move is remarkable it eliminates quite a lot of soft tissue injuries it um improves performance immediately by what, 
50%, sometimes more. Sometimes people just need to have a body that works to be able to play their speech, to be able to play their sport, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't really matter what sport I do. So I now do a three-day eventer and nobody can work out, she's very young, nobody can work out, except for her and I and her parents, how she's improved. And here's a lesson. If you improve the rider's functionality, the horse is able to do all the things it was actually capable of that the rider wasn't allowing them mm -hmm. to do because the rider's body was wrong, not the horse. Mm -hmm. And for me, that was huge. But, you know, I've done basketball players, tennis players, and they all improve. And that, for me, is the big difference. And probably what excites me more, because without sounding terrible, it is so easy for me to make somebody, I get bored. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and training has a more rapid response, and it works quicker. And so, yeah, that's me up to date. Okay, I, li I like it. Um Going back on your on your journey so far, so I want to talk about that transition that you had as, from from the sprinter to being a coach. How did that happen? Did you always know you wanted to coach, or did that happen kind of organically through the process of being an athlete and then transitioning to something else? No, here's how it happened. My husband fell out with the coach that we currently had, walked off the track, and in the car on the way home said, "You'll have to do it." <laughs> that is how it, genuinely how it happened I had been involved um, in helping in watching I'm, I have great vision in that I can slow movement down and I can see I see the body as a whole I've always seen the body as a whole and if something doesn't look right I'd find a way to making it work right and initially that was my role in his coaching was feedback and I never lie as a coach you cannot lie because you tell somebody oh you're amazing you're so much faster and then they go out and try and play the game and hello they're not so never lie and he would say to me what was my pickup like in the second run of the third set and I could always tell him and it was what he felt mm -hmm. so that genuinely is how I have no coaching qualifications, none, zilch, nothing. <laughs> um, do you know what I mean? It was, a and I think I'm a better coach because I learn on the job. Mm. But it's a kind of risky thing to learn trying to make somebody the fastest man in the world. There's not mm. a lot of room for, <laughs> for getting it wrong. For sure. Um, what what were some of the early struggles that you ran into as a as a young coach who, like you said, didn't have any formal education? And like you very well said, it doesn't mean that you can't you know be qualified and learn how to do it properly on the job. But um, we all you know run into run into some uh, barriers uh, when we start something new. And so, what were what were yours? Well, my first role as a coach at an international event was the Commonwealth Games. Mm -hmm. in Edmonton in 78, which Alan won, was second in the 100 to Don Quarry, won the 100, won the 200, sorry. And the press said to him, who's your coach? And he said, my wife. And you know what the press said, like, they'll ask the same question in a different way because you haven't given them the answer they wanted. Mm -hmm. So they would say, no, 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 yes, who is currently looking after your athletics? He said, my wife. And that in 1978 was totally revolutionary. There was no wife, there was no woman. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not a great fact finder, but friends like to tell me things about myself, um, which I normally know, but sometimes I don't. But apparently I was the first woman ever to coach a mainstream 100 meter, um, 100 meter Olympic gold medalist. I didn't really come up against any... Um, Nothing that was bad, nothing. Nobody had to go because I was a woman. People keep asking me, is it harder because you're a woman? No, it's not. Do you know what I mean? It's um, different, and it was definitely different then. But 
it was harder because I was married to him. It wasn't mm -hmm. easy, but mm -hmm. it was easier in some ways because we had the same social, well, we didn't have a social life. There's no point in me lying. Um, but we lived in the same house. We went to training together. I was still running. We both had full-time jobs, so we had that separation. But huge amount of respect from people. I mean, most people, I was 27 at the Olympics. I was 25 when I started helping. And really, most coaches were 45, 50. Mm -hmm. And the other ones that learned, the same way I learned, have all died and left me on my own <laughs> with, <laughs> with this. Right. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so, no, I didn't, no, I don't, I didn't really come up with any reticence really. Okay, that's that's good to hear, uh, especially in in those in those years. I know it's it's come a long way, but it's good to hear that you were able to to kind of make your path at that point in time. What you talked, you mentioned it a couple of times, so I want to come back on it. The demands of coaching at the elite level. Um, I think a lot of coaches starting out have the dream to work with elite athletes, and but without really knowing what it entails. What are the sacrifices you have to make? What are the demands of coaching at such a high level? So could you expand a little bit on that and your experience in that situation? Okay. I knew nothing else but coaching at elite level. It mm -hmm. is my comfort zone. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know what it was like to coach at a lower level. I had nothing to compare it with and I had nobody to ask. Um, we use different training methods so, you know, it was an enigma. Britain had never had a sprinter since 19 something or other. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Um, so it was a kind of, a, I was doing a lonely furrow, really. Um, but I love elite coaching. But it's not, a lot of people that were associated with us couldn't handle the pressure. Couldn't take, maybe that's where my youth and my inexperience came in handy because I didn't know what what I should have been doing mm. or what it was like to do it or what it was like to do it at a different level. Mm. Cause this was all I knew, but I still love and adore elite level coaching. Mm. Right. I, 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 the, the guys say, Margo, Margo, I'm not quite, I know you're not quite there yet, but we're going to have to get you there and get you there quick because that's what I enjoy watching. Um, but I never found it stressful. I think, Looking back, I think people are good at certain levels of coaching and there's great kids coach, but you need to know when to put, pass them on if you're not comfortable at the next level. It's, you know, there's always going to be people involved in people's careers at an early age, whether it's the PE teacher, their, you know, the school coach or whatever it is, but you need to know when to let go and pass it on to somebody who does know and mm -hmm. is comfortable at that level if you're not comfortable. And I think a lot of coaches find that difficult. Well, I've got you to hear, I'm hanging on because you'll be famous. I mean, I took on a young kid and he said to me, all his coaches always say to him, now remember mention me in the press? I said to him, you mention me in the press, I'll tell you. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. A coach doesn't do it. I don't do it for publicity. I didn't do it to be well known. In fact, it was more of a hindrance to be well known <laughs> than it was a help. Um, I don't do it for people to know who I am. I don't, it doesn't bother me if nobody knows who I am. Do you know what I mean? You coach to make somebody better. And sometimes that better is just for them to be in the school first team. You know, sometimes that better is, you know, to play county, whatever, sport. And then sometimes, if you're really lucky, you're at the highest level. And it did help me having been an athlete. I must say that, it did help me being an athlete. Mm -hmm. um, but then, the sub if you're really, really lucky, you get somebody who's totally dedicated to their cause, which I was, who will sacrifice everything in order to, and this is a big word, to try to achieve their dream. I mean, the Olympics is every four years. And what we were asking was that he would run faster than everybody else. A pretty tall order when you look at it in facts. Mm -hmm. But that's, that was the name of the game. And we were just so lucky. And there is luck in it. 
that we, that you want. Um, a lot of people work really, really hard. And you know, there's a lot of great athletes. I was saying this the other day. There's a lot of great athletes never won the Olympics. Or great whatever sports people, if I round them up in, in, in athletics. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, for a coach, you kind of have to enjoy the journey. You have to enjoy the ride. Um, I sometimes look back and think I was too young, but that was the hand I was dealt with, get on with it. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Um, I mean, when I do talks, like I'll say, you know, if your husband comes in, you're watching Coronation Street and says, you know, do you want to make me the fastest man in the world? Say no, it's too hard. But at the time, I didn't know it was too hard. Mm -hmm. And people have said to me, why did you think you could make your husband the fastest man in the world? And I said, it wasn't that I thought I could. I never thought I couldn't. Yeah, so like you said, maybe the a bit of the innocence of your younger years just playing into that and allowing you to just just trust the process and move forward without second guessing yourself. Yeah, yeah. So bringing coming into, you know, the coaching world, like you said without any formal education in the in the field, but with your experience as an, as an athlete and being quite young, what were some of the things that you did differently compared to the other coaches that were around at the at the same level? Maybe just because you just had your own lens, your own way of viewing things and doing things, what were those uh, those unique things that you might have done in the past and maybe still have carried on till today? Oh, I've still got bits of it. So Alan never trained with weights. Mm -hmm. He did as a youngster, but not in his sprint years. Um, so we adopted a different way of training from a coaching program that was mainly at that time there was a difference between amateur athletes and professional athletes. Mm. So it was all body weight based, big high numbers, high numbers um, of repetitions and block and, and speedball. Oh, I love speedball training. It is just, if I could have one piece of equipment, that was the one I would choose is a speedball. My guy still hit it and it's so competitive. We have a board um, with the numbers that they hit and mm. trust me, it is so competitive. Um, and we would do it in blocks. Looking back on it, there was a lot of things wrong with it. But Alan was coming from a background of long jump and triple jump as a youngster. Mm -hmm. but then long jump, huge power base, huge power base. So that, so it, we kind of turned without knowing it at the time, his basic strength and power into speed. Mm. We changed the way around. Um, and that to me now is the biggest thing I tell kids. You don't run with your legs, you run with your arms. And I still use that today and it still works. Faster your arms go, faster your legs go. If your arms go side to side, your legs go side to side. If your arms go forward, Every action's got an equal and opposite reaction. You're sending yourself backwards. It is crucial to run in fast in a very elementary way. Mm. So people say, give me three tips to run fast. Bend your arms, lean forward, run on your toes. Works 100 at 100. Faster mm. your arms move, faster your legs move. The problem with speed is you have to underpin it with all the things it needs. So it needs speed strength, speed endurance, power. I mean, the speed's almost the icing on the cake. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? There's no mm -hmm. point in being able to run fast and then dying at 60 in 100. There's no point in on a rugby field being only able to, to run fast for 20 meters when you make an interception in your own 22 and you've got to run the length of the field. It is complex in a simple way. <laughs> it, 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 I adore it for its simplicity and its immediacy, but it is quite a complicated, um, you have to, I call it a recipe for success, mm -hmm. right? So I'll say to the guys, if I asked you to bake a cake and you had no flour, no sugar, no eggs, no milk, they'll go, well, I can't bake the cake. No, well, you can't perform at the highest level without speed strength, speed endurance, sprint endurance, power, speed, Simple, right? Yes. So you need all the, the ingredients of the cake. And the key thing is the cake. 
Mm. If the cake's not strong enough to hold the icing and the cherry on the top, the whole thing collapses and you get injured. See, it's simple. Right. So the, the analogy of a strong base to build upon, uh, you, you mentioned the background of, of your husband being a, a jumper to begin with. Yeah. Do you think, looking back, is that maybe why he didn't maybe need uh, to, to train with weights because he was a very elastic, very reactive athlete uh, compared to maybe other, you know, archetypes of athletes that are more kind of strength, power-based, kind of heavier, and that don't have that, maybe that, uh, that reactivity and that elasticity? It, it, would, was that one of the components that draw you to, to not using weights with him? It wasn't. At the time, this group that we were training with initially – believed that weights made you slower. Mm. So they didn't do weights. Everybody else in the world did them and seemed to run fast. But, you know. but what you have to remember is Alan, was, when he was a long jumper, his fastest was 10-9, downhill, Yale assisted, and I think his grandma might have been timing. Um, <laughs> he, was, <laughs> he wasn't naturally your archetypal sprinter yeah so um it just was the right training at the right time it was the massive change of training that introduced the speed and it was totally different i mean he was going to retire mm. he was going to stop i mean he was 24 and think back 1976 24 as a sprinter you were ancient not now thankfully but then you were mm. so it was just, it worked for him. That's the easiest way I can tell. Is, I mean, it was like not using blocks. Why did we not use blocks? Because we were in a big group initially, of people sprinters, and there was too many, and you could keep measuring your blocks, picking them up to let the next group, and we thought, oh, to pop this. And found we could start just as well without them. Mm -hmm. But then the IWF thought otherwise, and so brought in a new rule for the Olympics, which was fine. It wasn't difficult. We'd used them before. It was, you know, it wasn't the big drama that everybody in Britain thought it was going to be. Mm. Um, but you learn by making mistakes, both as an athlete and as a coach. And we made loads. But it wasn't a disaster. We learned from them. We went back and changed them. And, and I say this to everybody in my squad. You don't learn by winning anything. You learn from your mistakes. What did you learn about uh, yourself? Maybe it was a mental thing, maybe it was a physical thing, you need to fix this. What happened? And, you know, that's a key. The thing is, you can't take your head at the, the athlete, be it whatever sportsman you are. Sprinters have a, a certain type of head. So, um, I always say, you bring me the head, I'll give you the body. That's it's when it's easier. And I'll say to kids, you know when your head wants you to do something, but your body doesn't allow you to do it? How did you know that, they say? I said, because it happens a lot. You know, people assess situations, well, I'm not going to, I'm not fast enough to get there, so I'm not going to run there, I'll stay here. And I'll, I'll do this. I said, I'll give you the body that allows your head to play the game that you want to. Well, and that are, is key. What are some of the things... So you talked about making mistakes and accepting that and embracing that along the way. What are some of the things that you changed your mind about since you started coaching back in the day? I now do weights. <laughs> <laughs> I do weights. <laughs> but again, I looked at the weights that everybody else was doing and adapted them to my way. You've got to know which muscles you use to run fast. So once you know the muscles you need to, you have to, Find a way of making them stronger. And I didn't like, I, I, I'll say it here and now publicly, I hate the new method of squatting. And I will go a long way to, so none of my players will do it. And we kind of have to make up little lies as to why they're no, so they'll say things like, oh, it hurts my back. Well, it does. Oh, it, you know, it, it's not conducive to running fast. So I have, I do squat, but I squat for speed and speed strength. Mm -hmm. And I activate the muscles. So 
you need to know the technique. You need to know what muscles you need when you run fast. And you need to then train them in a way that, like, none of my sessions last longer than, oh, on a bad day, 45 minutes, if I've been doing a lot of correcting. Right? Warm up. Why do people warm up for days? They're exhausted by the time they get to the activity. Right? I don't jog, ever. We don't, we don't jog to warm up. We don't static sit. So I developed all this over the years. I changed. And a lot of people said to me, why would you change a, a method of training that was successful? Well, it was successful. But there was a lot of flaws in it. Mm. There wasn't enough hamstring in it. There wasn't enough, you know, the weights were needed to, to give more speed strength. And the more I learned about functionality, the more I realized that I had to do different types of weights. But why do people train for an hour? It has to be an hour or two hours. Or, well, you can't train for two hours. People can't even think for two hours. Half an hour at the door, gone, boom. Next. It's, you know, and everything I do on a, on a track, on a field, is 100%. What is the point in running slowly? So I don't do volume. Not yet. My rugby players, my football players, my hockey players do not do tempo running. We don't do volume running. Because when you go and do the activity, now you've pressed the wrong button because I'm off. <laughs> when you do activity, intensity, you have to train with intensity not volume so do running you, slowly is i haven't found a good use for running slowly to be honest yeah so like you said you know you have to run fast if you want to run faster do you then yeah. do you then leave all the conditioning to the sport itself and to the the sports coaches and you deal really specifically with the the speed portion of things no i've done i've done a bit a million things I've done it where I had total control. So the players only trained, all their fitness was done with me. Mm -hmm. um, which, to be honest, if you think about it, you know, clubs are paying these people money and then they give them to me. I mean, it was a huge privilege. Mm -hmm. Was it right? Was it wrong? I think the players abused it. And, you know, like I didn't realize my players were saying things like, oh, you're rubbish, this is rubbish training, whatever. And everybody thought it was coming for me. So it caused me a lot of angst. It caused me a lot of problems um, over the years. So now I try and fit in. So at the minute, I'm in a very privileged position in that my players at clubs are allowed to do my training within the concept of the club. Mm -hmm. So I Zoom sessions sometimes. So I write the session. But the guys always have done a prolonged period of training with me so they understand the techniques and things. So I'll write their programs, they do it at the club. I mean, who else is that privilege? Nobody. I don't know anybody, other co any other coach that's allowed to do that. So for that, I'm exceedingly grateful. So it's kind of, again, it's evolved over the years. It's gone from total to, I mean, I've walked away a couple of times. I thought, oh, I've had enough of this. I, do you know what I mean? But something always drags me back. What, what is it? What drags you back? I blame the universe. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a good, that's a good one to point the finger at. <laughs> yes. It's your fault that I'm still doing this job. <laughs> I do love it. Um, it's frustrating, enjoyable, rewarding. Um, Everything, every probably adjective you could think of. All of um, the above, yeah. All of the above and more. Um, and I'm just really, really grateful for the fact that I'm allowed to work with the people I work with and see their journey. I mean, one of the guys just texted me today and he's just got in the England squad. Well, he's not. He's in the England team to play Italy. No, he's not in the team. He's in the, the playing squad. Mm -hmm. And I mean, when he, he was going to retire and go to university and he kept getting injured and, and that's, been a lot, that's been a hard journey, that one. But then you get that on your phone 
at half past eight in the morning, you think, ha, that was worth it, yippee. So, do you know what I mean? It's, I mean, sometimes you, you need to know when to give somebody a hug and when to give them a kick up the ass. Um, do you know what I mean? And it, like, you know, I had a young guy and he said to me, I kept picking on him. I said, hello, this is coaching. I'm not picking on you. And he said, but you keep telling me I'm not doing everything right. I said, yeah, well, I could let you do all the things you do do, right? And are you going to get any better doing that? Well, no. I said, no. So I pick on the things that you are not good at and I make them better, which makes you better. But it's called coaching. Young kids today, they think they know everything. They are amazing. They'll tell you, oh, no, I think you've got that wrong. Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> what are what are some of the teams or athletes that you've worked with over the years that maybe had the most impact on you as a coach as you 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 brought what you had to bring to them but they also had a positive impact on you as a as a person and as a coach hmm. i should really say my husband but that wasn't true <laughs> That was just the most exhausting thing I've ever done in my entire life. And the hardest. They all bring something different. Um, some of them, like Danny Cipriani, bring the just the best rugby brain I have ever worked with. And I've worked with great rugby players. I mean, just phenomenal. I could sit and just watch him move with a ball. Um, and he was young and he was enthusiastic and desired to play at the highest level. And so he had a big impact. Mm -hmm. Mike Brown, who, as I used to say to him, I could turn the Queen Mary ship quicker than his feet moved, um, brought a brain and an enthusiasm, but a terrible body. <laughs> a, a really malfunctioning body and to see what functionality enables them to do over the years was phenomenal. Um, I mean, if I'm going way back, then we've got, um, you know, Dan Luger, Dom Chapman, who were just young. And to see them achieve their dreams of playing international, what they all bring is an enthusiasm and a desire to be the best that they can be. They bring it in different ways, and everyone's a challenge. Um, I mean, the horse riding, I love this. Oh, this is new, and do you know what I mean? And mm -hmm. um, my horse rider's mother, who was an international horse rider, said to me the other day, it is utterly remarkable how you understand this sport and you've never been on a horse and never competed on a horse. No, but I have competed. So, do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, it's just different people bring different things. Um, they all grow in confidence. That's the one thing they all say. And the press rang me up one day and said, why are all your players confident? I said, what do you do? You think I sit in front of them? Well, what to go? You will be confident. You will be confident. He said, well, we did worry. I said, oh, don't be stupid. You know, that's what having faith in your body and your, you know, confidence in your mind allows you to do. And, and they work hand in hand. When you make somebody faster, stronger, more powerful, their confidence grows and the two things go together. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and we learn. Every, the one thing I say before I coach anybody is how good do you want to be? If I say, what do you want me to do? They all say, make me faster. Ugh, boring. They... I want to be, I want to play for someday or I want to do whatever. It is. Okay, I said, look, I'm happy to go that journey, but there's going to be hurdles along the way. It's not easy. They think it's going to be easy. They think, oh, I'll be coached by Margot Wells and I'll be successful. No, it doesn't work like that. People never see. They see you running on the track, playing rugby for an England shirt or a Scotland shirt. They see all that, but they don't understand the amount of effort by the coach and the player that goes into that performance. What does it take from the standpoint of, of the player 
to make it to that elite level? What what's commonalities or similarities have you find uh, between all the people that you worked with who have made it to that top level of the game? Huge work ethic, ability to um, pick themselves up when things go wrong, ability to, and I help in all these things on the sideline, but they have to bring self-belief, even when they're playing in the third team. Right, people come to me and, and like, but they've got a huge self belief that they know there's a huge amount of ability trapped in this body that doesn't work, and to unlock that is great. I mean, it's, it's, it's you know, it's fabulous. And and I've gone off on track. What do they bring? They bring dedication. They bring. I mean, my functionality exercises. If they don't do them, I know. And I know which ones I haven't done. And trust me, you do not walk into my gym with a body that hasn't done their functionality before you get there. And the youngsters struggle with that. Most of the easiest people, you know, successful people are the easiest people in the world to coach. Mm -hmm. The hard ones are the ones that are trying to make it. They're the, the angst and all the, you know, did you do this? No. Oh. Well, what do you want me to do about it? I they, have been known to, they have been known to say, you fix it, you always fix it. Which is true, but, you know, uh, you need to bring the effort mm -hmm. with it. Yeah, I want to I talk about those uh, functional exercises that you use with your athletes. But first, I want to come back on, on self-belief. Um, do you think that's something that somebody has or doesn't have, or can it be built along the way? Both, really. A lot of people have self-belief and it's misplaced. So they believe they're better than... I've been known to tell people, you're not as good as you think you are. Um, you know, if you're successful at a young age and people are always, as I call it, blowing smoke up your ass and tell you you're wonderful, they start to believe it. And that's not good. That's not a good self-belief. That's an artificial self-belief. And it'll get, you know, found out always gets found out. The, the right fitness, the right mental help can make somebody believe. But there's a lot of people go and are fueled by fear of failure, not belief in success. Mm -hmm. And that works. So let's go now on to you, the, the exercise that you mentioned that you get your athletes to do now those those functional exercises what do they look like what are they based on and what's the idea behind using those okay they're based on that's this is easy bit they're based on whoever's the best in the world at moving in that sport so i will study so i didn't have this well in or whatever right but i will study roger federer's movement i will study the best dressage rider I will study the best show jumper, the best um, people who move the best in, you know, any sport whatsoever. And then they all had something in common. It was all exactly the same thing. They all, so Roger Federer moves as one unit. So the body has to be what I call joined up. So Roger Federer hits the ball with his body. He doesn't hit it with his arm. So all those great big long outstretched things, his arm is being supported by his body so he can hold his hand up and still hit the ball back. Um, he moves as one unit. So I don't see the point in training upper body only and lower body only because the two have to work together. Mm -hmm. So basically that's what I do, right? So the exercises that I have created, they're not gym exercises, they're done with flexi bands. They work without flexi bands, but over the years, I've probably had about 50 of them, and I've now narrowed them down. And uh, So I'll come up with one which will eliminate three others. I did that the other day. Um, how do I do it? 
the guys kind of freak out because I kind of talk to myself. My head talks to me and tells me what to do and I have a vision of what it's meant to look like. I know it's weird. I know it's weird. But you have to connect the brain to the body and that's what makes it change immediately. Mm. Right? So basically, I block the body. And that doesn't mean to say it won't move. It just means you join it up. So there's an exercise that will join up the head all the way down the back to your heels. There's an exercise that will join up the sides. There's an exercise that joins up the front. There's an exercise that joins the lower part of your arm to its upper part. It is crucial that the shoulder girdle anchors into your ass and is held there, right? Now, the thing that stops you doing that is big lats. Chins on a bar, anything that involves the body coming in, this gets tight, it has to sit out and slot in. It's, like, it's a bit like um, building blocks, mm. right? Loads of world-class people run, play tennis, play hockey, whatever, and their feet are not neurologically attached to the bottom of their legs, and they flap, and they trip over them, and they hurt them. And, you know, there's certain sports over the years, so tennis, hockey, football, not so much rugby, they all, when you play them, disconnect the bottom of your leg and your feet from the top of your leg. Right? Because they shuffle. They're all, all the movements all short and stabby and backwards and forwards and like this. Um, running, so rugby, not so much. Um, the faster you make somebody, the more important functionality becomes. Because speed needs that support or it'll break down and get injured. So back to your original question, what do they look like? Um, I'll tell you what the names are and maybe that'll help. Mm. Right? So the main player, the one that happens every day before they do anything, is called four point back. Because there's four points in it and it helps you back. One's called Superman. And what that does is join, it doesn't look like the Superman that, you, that the yoga people do, whatever, right? Mm -hmm. Superman is great for improving co hand-eye coordination, eh, sorry, coordination. And you always do it opposite. And you have to touch your leg. Or the brain won't do it. It's like writing a text and forgetting to press send. It doesn't get it. It's, I know it's weird. I even sound weird. That's why I laughed when I was saying, like, how do I explain this? Right? Because it's weird. Right? It works immediately. It definitely works. And you know what? I don't want to keep it to myself. I am desperately trying to get it out there. I want every kid in the country, every kid in the world, there's a big key. Well, I made the man the fastest man in the world. Why so know every kid in the world? To learn how to run, but they need functionality to run. So you, the two go together. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've done pilot studies with kids. And, you know, they're like, that was great. I mean, I did a thing with a rugby group. And rugby haven't been the most receptive, you know. And we did a warm-up. And just by teaching, so they were in groups of speed, fastest there. And there was a kid that was in the slowest group. And just by teaching them how to run, he was the fastest of them all. That got them talking and sitting up and looking. But do you know what I mean? There are seriously talented kids, teenagers, adults who are not achieving their dreams because their body keeps breaking down, because they haven't got, you know, they didn't even try because, you know, Alan wasn't even the fastest in his class, never mind the fastest in his school, right? And if he can win the Olympics, then there is something out there. Not everybody's allowed to do that, everybody, but he had the head. He had the head to win the Olympics more than he had the body. When you line up, everybody's, you know, trained the best they can ever do. Everybody's at their fastest. Everybody's, you know, so what separates them? What makes them apart? Why do they win? Their head. All right? Team sports, you know, you've got, you know, individual sports, you live and die by your own efforts. There's nobody to blame. There's nobody to, and so it's harder. Team sports, you can say, well, the past was not great or something. You've got an excuse. But still, you have to be the best. If you retire knowing that you 
tried your hardest, became the best, but had everything that you needed. So give the kids the things they need and let them decide whether they want to play sport. You know, mm -hmm. people say to me, oh, kids didn't like sport now. No, they, they do, but they don't get any better at it, so they don't do it. They play PlayStation because they get better at it and they achieve on it. You know, give the kids... I, if, if I can do this before I die, I'll be the happiest person alive. This will be a greater achievement than Alan's because, you know, it's available there and... I just think, you know, it needs to happen. Yeah, I, I Back wanna... to my functionality. So they're simple. Kids can do them. My granddaughter does them. She's four. Mm -hmm. Right? So they're not, well, see, I say they're no difficult. My guys always say to me, Margot, you never think anything's difficult. Because I have a functioning body. I can do my exercises better than they can do. I jumped the other day, I'm 68 years old, and I jumped up and down, and I said, how come I can jump better than two 17-year-olds? And then they all look at me like, oh. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You know? They're no capable of doing the training Alan I did. And, and again, because I've done it, they kind of go back, well, you, you didn't know how hard it is. What the rugby players say to me is, you didn't get your head kicked in every week. I said, no, I didn't. I said, because I was so fast, I had a lane all to myself, and I didn't have to get kicked, my head kicked in. <laughs> so the functionality is my quest at the minute. I, I it's what I des my, I desire to give it to people. Mm. I, I want to come back to the, the work that you do with kids and and the importance of sprinting and running properly for kids. But before that, I want to touch on a point that you mentioned, which is the the mindset in training and the difference between individual sports and, and team sports. Uh, I think personally, I realized that when I transitioned from, I, I did team sports pretty much all my youth and then did a few individual sports later on. And I found that the mental challenge of just having to deal with that, that you can't just point the finger to, the person next to you or the person on the other side of the pitch, you have to just deal with it. How can we try and bring that more to players, to athletes who are in a team setting, but who could benefit from, you know, raising that, that self-awareness and just uh, dealing with their own mind and their own things before they try to point the finger to another teammate or somebody on the, on the other team? Well, that's really simple for me because I have coached the team and um you know the fitness component of the team and i would just go over and say that that wasn't a bad but human nature is that you try and throw the blame onto somebody else and because of the way kids are and grow up these days they never think they're wrong they never get marked by a red pen they're never told they fail then that's not life that worries me. Like, they don't think for themselves. They come up onto the track and I'll say, right, walk up to that cone and there's one cone on the track. And they'll go, which cone? And then they'll look at their father and say, show me. I say, this is not happening. Right? So they come with, um, we were never taught like that. You were never taught like that. But they're taught like that, right? and they don't think for themselves. It's like a pre-programmed person arrives and they do what they're told. So in that way, it's easy for them. But when they can't do what they're trying to do, they, if they're not mentally strong enough, they'll blame somebody else. I mean, it happens at international level, in international teams all the time. And I think that coaches now sit in little slots in team sports. So one looks after this and one looks after that. And one, look. to me, I know they have a director of coaching who kind of oversees the whole thing, but why are they not saying, pulling people out? Like if I was a coach, I'd pull them out and say, you know, 
you know, he he dropped the, the pass or he didn't pick up the pass because you threw it on the floor. Now go over yourself and and work it out. Do you know what I mean? Like I, I remember saying to a rugby coach, if somebody drops a pass, why do you send them jogging around the pitch? It's not going to make them better at passing. <laughs> and they go, Oh, I never thought about it like that. You know, most coaches have come, I mean, not all of them have come, and they all have different things. Some people, you know, rule by fear. Some people rule, you know, they think it's about them and the players are stopping their success. It's not. But I think as it, it goes back to honesty. It goes back to being honest with the people that you work with, whether it's a team, whether it's an individual. It's harder. As an individual, it's harder, right? Because it's you against the rest of the world. And but even in a team sport, I talk about having team. So there was a team wells. We had a group of people who, you know, wanted down to do well, were there if we needed their help, didn't interfere if we didn't. Um, and and the team players need the same thing. So we always create a team around the player whether he plays a team sport or not. And um, that's one of the things I learned from coaching Alan was, you know, you know, you can't do it yourself. You might do the training yourself and you might do the bulk of it and the information side of it, but you need people around you. It, it just support you as well as, I mean, you know, 25 and you typically squat about anything, but, um, I think everybody needs a team, but they need an honest team. Mm. And they need somebody to say, you know what, that, like, I'll tell you a funny story. I had a player, it was the same player that rang me today and said he was in the England squad, right? And very fast, naturally fast and powerful. And thought that was enough, that was all he needed. And it wasn't. And I worked really, really hard on him. And he played a game and I used the word lazy, right? Everybody else said to him, you didn't work hard enough. I said, no, you were lazy. And I, all week, I was on his case, all week. The next game, he was great. Wasn't he brilliant, right? He's learning to be better. But he was, he played, he tried his hardest, he worked hard, he did what he, you know, what he was trying to do. And one of my other players said, he was watching that game, he said, I laughed and laughed and laughed. And his partner said to him, why are you laughing? He said, because margo has been on his case all week and look what it's produced, right? So afterwards I said to him, I knew you were playing going, I'll show her, I'll show her, I can do this. I'll show her I'm better than that. I'm not lazy and whatever. And I was right. I said, I don't care. Do you know what I mean? So sometimes it takes honesty for somebody to see, you know what, you're not working hard enough. You think you are. And I've had people say to me, I'm dedicated to doing this. I, I know what dedication is, and this doesn't look like it. Do you know what I mean? So I think being honest with people and no blown smoke where it's no meant to be blown is, um, is the key to any sport, whether it's a team sport, an individual sport. You have to be honest with yourself and you have the people around you have to be honest. I like I like that way of uh, of seeing things, Margot. It was a pleasure talking to you. I want to finish with with that one point talking about children and running and sprinting. So, in your in your mind, why should children be taught how to run and how to sprint? Makes them enjoy any sport, whatever it is. Gives them a feeling of Alan always called it flying. Feels like flying when you run fast, and it gives them an option. It gives them a choice. Teach them how to run, give them a functioning body, and let them do with it whatever they want to do with it. Mm. If it's just playing in the playground, if it's just, you know, the stars will still be the stars because they'll have the right head. But every child should experience what it's like to run faster than they currently run and not get hurt. Margot, it was a great pleasure talking to you today. For, for those who want to learn more about what you do, where can they find more information? Well, we have a website called um, Wellfast, where you know my training methods are up there. I'm currently talking to people about trying to, you know, make 
my information more accessible. So, you know, hopefully that will, fingers crossed, that will come to fruition and then, you know, we can produce apps and, and stuff like that. But I'm working on it. I'm not just sitting there thinking, you know, oh, I would like this to happen. I'm actually doing something about it. That's great. Well, I'll, I'll make sure to put the link to your website in the podcast description for everybody listening. Go check out what Margot is up to. Uh, Margot, thanks again for your time today. It was a pleasure, Sean. Thank you for asking me to talk. My pleasure. Talk soon. Okay. Bye-bye.